Let's get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is Rush University Medical Center Division of Nephrology Renal Biopsy Conference for December 23rd, 2021. Uh, today's CME code is 484341. Uh, we've got a great case today, Dr. Corbett. I think we have three polls, so it ought to be fun. Uh, should be a lot of discussion. It's a really interesting case with some really interesting twists. Um, you know, as usual, we have nothing to disclose. Uh, this patient has been de-identified and we are recording and it'll be available on YouTube shortly. Please uh, join our channel if you haven't. And uh, if you know anybody that wants to get on our mailing list, by all means, let us know. Um, and uh, let's get started. Steve, you want to... Uh, Read our protocol for us. Case has been so de-identified, I don't even recognize it. All right. We have patients, a 42-year-old white male who presented with sudden onset lower extremity edema and a 30-pound weight gain. He was found to have nephrotic syndrome with a serum cranium of 0 .8, uh, 0 0.87 milligram per deciliter, serum albumin of 1.1, and a 24-hour urine protein of almost 10 grams. The review of systems was really the weight gain and, and lower extremity edema. Past medical history is uh, only positive for hypertension. He'd had some shoulder and uh, knee uh, surgery done in the past. Uh, social histories, uh, occasional smoker, drinks alcohol uh, socially, but hasn't drunk since 2019. Previously uh, used cocaine, but hasn't used it since 2019. Family history, his mother uh, had a history of coronary artery disease, hypertension, and she's bipolar and has a history of alcohol abuse. Father also bipolar with hypertension, type 2 diabetes mellitus, and uh, history of alcohol abuse as well. The sister has no known uh, health problems. He has no allergies. His medications consist of lisinopril, omeprazole, and he does take NSAIDs frequently. Physical exam, his blood pressure was 146 over 83. Uh, pulse. Uh, was 84, height 5 feet 11, weight 260 pounds. He normally weighed around 230. Physical exam was remarkable for 4 plus edema to the thighs. Had no adenopathy or evidence of uh, inf uh, inf uh, joint inflammation or rashes. No hepatosplenomegaly, and the remainder of the exam was really normal. Laboratory data at the time of the biopsy is sodium was 136, potassium 47, chloride 105, bicarb 26, BUN 22, creatinine 0.7. Who keeps moving this, the marker? Uh, glucose 95, calcium 7.8, total bilirubin 0 0.2, AST 52, ALT 43, and the alkphos was 42. Albumin was 1.1, total protein of 4.6, cholesterol 438, triglycerides elevated to 210, HDL was 97, and his LDL was 298. White count was 10,500 with a normal differential. Hemoglobin was 15.5. MCV was normal and his platelet count was normal. His urinalysis had a specific gravity of 1020, four plus protein, moderate blood, uh, but only one to two red cells per high power field with no casts noted. 24 hour urine had 9.9 .9 grams as already stated and it, the urine protein creatinine ratio was about six grams. He had a serologic evaluation, including quantitative immunoglobulins, free light chain, kappa lambda ratio, serum immunofixation, Complement levels, ANA, rheumatoid factor, hep B antigen antibody, hep C antibody, RPR, and HIV, all of which were normal or negative. And as usual, the PLA2R antibody was pending. CT of the abdomen and pelvis was done with IV contrast and had normal kidneys. The liver was noted to have a fat, fatty infiltration, but was otherwise unremarkable. Uh, he had mild thickening noticed around the, uh, or mask-like effect around the greater curvature of the stomach, but they couldn't say much more about it because the stomach was kind of collapsed. Um, a small amount of ascites and a right pleural effusion was noted, and he had a renal biopsy performed the next day or so. Um, anybody have any questions uh, for Dr. Corbett? Good. Well, uh, Casey, you want to walk us through this case? Yeah, I mean, this is a pretty typical presentation for minimal change disease. Um, sudden onset, very nephrotic, very high problem, very high lipid levels. I suspect those CT findings are probably just from the patient being in a SAR cake and having both ascites and pleural effusion. So that's probably that. Hopefully this isn't anything malignant. 
Um, other things outside, I think my top three will be minimal change, just the way this presented. Um, PLA 2 r is pending, so membranous, whether this could be from a malignancy or primary membranous is on the differential, again, less likely. <clears throat> Serologic workup is negative. He's Caucasian. You could still get FSGS, um, uh, but I feel like it's, it's less common. Uh, but, you know, if you do have FSGS, this would be consistent with a tip lesion, which would act a little bit more like minimal change disease. Uh, could be collapsing FSGS that could present this, this rapidly in onset. So I'm going to go with minimal change as my number one, uh, two and three. And then after that, it would be membranous and FSGS. It seems like uh, systemic diseases uh, have, based on serologies and evaluation of pair proteins, have been excluded, although we can sometimes get surprised and the kidney would be the first manifestation. I'm going to go with minimal change. <clears throat> Sounds good. How do you feel about the non steroidal history? You think that's enough to be related? Says, yeah, I mean, it can be. Um, you know, it's. Um, yeah, I mean, it says on a regular basis. So of course, uh, that's that's one of the common causes of secondary minimal change disease. So that's that's definitely on the differential. Does it bother you that there's no AKI with it? I mean, you know, sometimes it accompanies AKI and interstitial nephritis. Does that bother you at all? Um, no, no. I mean, if it was present, I, I guess that would be noted. But the fact that it's not there doesn't really exclude minimal change. It doesn't really also bother me at all. Uh, Steve, I have a question for you. I forgot to ask earlier. Uh, what's his did he get vaccinated recently around that time? But certainly we've seen, a, you know, that being a minimal change being Dr. Gagashi's number one and two and three diagnosis. We see a lot of uh, de novo and relapsing minimal changes. Do you know his vaccination uh, story? You no, know, he had been vaccinated, but it had been some time ago. It wasn't relative. It wasn't it wasn't relative to this presentation or recent. It wasn't. It had been long before this. OK. Um, let me see. Uh, I don't think Dr. Whittier is around. Uh, Prevere, what do you think is going on? Yeah, I agree. I, I think uh, minimal change, as Casey mentioned, would be on my top, just given his uh, abrupt onset, uh, you know, and, and the other, he has quite severe, uh, his lipid panel and his low albumin and the entire thing. Uh, is it NSAID associated or not? I think definitely you'd have to take into consideration just given his age. I mean, less likely to happen at 40 years old, but you know, you can see it. Um, uh, so I think minimal change is number one in terms of other things I would consider uh, with uh, his, uh, <clears throat> his presentation. Um, the two other major ones would be membranous and FSGS. And if it is an FSGS lesion, he could be a, a tip lesion uh, kind of present again, very similar to minimal change. And then membranous has to be on the differential. Um, he, uh, he's uh, typically more fifth decade of life, but he is 42, and um, you know he 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 has a, a normal creatinine. The abrupt onset uh, makes me lean more towards minimal change, but I think uh, if it, it did have membranous, it would be um, quite uh, it wouldn't be surprising to me. Um, the pillar two R is pending, so uh, uh, secondary causes I don't see much here. Um, and then uh, amyloid or paraprotein related, I, that's unlikely at this point. He has negative serologic worker for that. His age doesn't really fit with that. He doesn't really have any other signs of uh, kind of a, a paraprotein related um, lesion. So um, I, I don't have much more to add. And I agree with the stuff on the ascites and pleural effusion. Uh, it's just related to his nephrotic syndrome. Um, it's quite nephrotic. I mean, his albumin is quite low. So I have a, Steve, I have a question for you. I know you're, you've written a lot on FSGS. Uh, a couple of people brought up, if it's FSGS, it's you know more likely to be the tip lesion. Is that really true? I mean, if it's FSGS, it seems more like a primary FSGS. But of the people that have primary FSGS, is that more likely to be a tip lesion? Or of those that have FSGS, the tip lesion is more likely to respond? you understand my question? So, I mean, the tip lesion presents like minimal change disease, which this is presenting very much like. Uh, you know, he, he does have a history already of hypertension, so that kind of would go along a little bit with FSGS, but this, again, is very sudden in onset, not something that's been going on for a while. Uh, tip uh, yeah, lesions, tip lesions definitely more likely to respond to treatment, for sure. 
Uh, is, the, is, the, is the acute presentation of nephrotic syndrome in FSGS, is that more like, I know they re respond more, is it more like predictive of a TIP lesion? That's no, what I'm we, getting at. We, we could, I mean, we saw NOS that presented that way as well. Okay. And That's collapsing, kind of collapsing will present that way too. Yeah, good. I mean, okay. All right. But it's just that there are other features, you know, with collapsing for sure, usually the creatinine wouldn't be 0.7, it usually yeah. be higher. Um, anyway. Yeah, Dr. Glassick, what do you think is going on? Well, I would agree this certainly looks like minimal change disease. Uh, with the history of non steroidals I would certainly uh, pay attention to that, particularly if the non steroidals are of the keto variety, ketorolac, because those varieties have a greater propensity to produce uh, a lead like minimal change disease. My question for the Clinicians would be, would you wait until the PLA 2R antibody has returned before you do the biopsy? Because wow. if it is positive, uh, you have to ask whether a treatment without a biopsy would be appropriate. I agree that it's not likely to be positive. That's low down on the differential. Would you wait to biopsy until the PLA2R antibody test is available? Well, that's a really that's a really good question because it's a uh, you know it's a moving target and the target keeps moving as every week goes by. The target keeps moving towards exactly what you're saying that if you have a PLA a significant you know PLA2R positive, that you could probably just uh, assume that it's membranous. Um, the the caveat here being he's so nephrotic it really seems like minimal change. But I think this this the the, the specificity is awfully good. Uh, if it's positive, um, I I don't know. Has anybody in this group uh, uh, had that situation where they've treated based on you know on a PLA two R yet and 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 not biopsy? I I mean I think we're ready to, but has anybody done that? No, I, I haven't per se. But I I also I'll let everybody else answer. But I've got a follow up for Dr. Glassick as well. Once everybody says whether they've done it or not. Yeah, I mean. Uh, well, the, uh, uh, the reason I ask this is that. A kidney biopsy is going to delay the ability to treat this patient with anticoagulants. And with a serum albumin of 1.1 and a membranous nephropathy, this patient needs anticoagulation right away. So, so I, my question is, is Dr. Glassick, is you know, whenever I read these articles about using PLA2R as a, you know, as, as a way to basically diagnose membranous without doing a biopsy, which I think is an interesting concept. They always say after you've ruled out secondary causes. Mm -hmm. And so I guess the question is they've done a fairly good serologic evaluation. Would you, would you pursue a malignancy evaluation in this guy to rule out secondary malig you know, malignancy uh, before you would go ahead and just empirically treat based on the PLA2R? Because there are patients who have malignancies. Well, she doesn't have any, any, uh, a history that's compatible with it. I think this patient, if he were to have a positive PLA2R, would be a candidate for treatment without biopsy. Okay. And treatment would consist of anticoagulation and rituximab. I agree, it's a very low probability situation, but the question is, if the, if the antibody is gonna come back in 24 hours or 48 hours, why not wait? What's the urgency? I think that's a good point. Good we point. probably do not get it back in 24 to 48, but that's, you know, at some point we probably will get it back in 24 to 48. Um, no, that's going to be, it's going to be a bigger issue as time goes on, especially if people have good renal function and, and uh, everything else is negative. I, there's, there's no question about it. You know, the, the, there's always the problem of this patient does need anticoagulation, but he also needs a renal biopsy. <laughs> and, you know, he presents to you and you got to, you know, you want to do the biopsy as quickly as possible and start anticoagulation as soon as you feel safe is post biopsy because it doesn't really matter. And if some lesions may be more hypercoagulable than others, we believe membranous might be have more likely to have a thrombo thrombosis. But uh, I think with this albumin, uh, it kind of doesn't really matter. You're going to want to anticoagulate this guy, but you also have to do a, a safe biopsy. Um, and, you know, that's tough. I'm looking in the chat board. Uh, so uh, would you buy adequate, of course, despite biopsy? Yeah, but you have to time it right. We don't need to really go into the timing. But um, and question two, if you believe in the overfill hypothesis of nephrotic syndrome, would one start an ENAC blockade up front? Well, 
the idea there is that is that uh, uh, the, the sodium is pri the kidney is a si primary salt retainer in nephrotic syndrome, and it has to do with proteinuria uh, stimulating the ENEC channel. And, you know, that's not an unreasonable thing to do, but it really is not uh, part of the, you know, that's a nephrotic syndrome treatment. Uh, I have not personally, even though I'm aware of that literature, I haven't really um, acted as much on that to see if blocking ENEC would, how much that will help the sodium retention. Um, Number three, would you start empirically with steroid before the biopsy? Well, you know, that's not crazy, but it, uh, but if, you know, if it turns out it's PLA2 positive, uh, steroids are probably not a, pri not a primary treatment for, for PLA2 or positive membranous, but would a few, day few days of steroids hurt? Probably not either. Uh, you could always stop it. Uh, you'd be a few days ahead on if it was minimal change. Um, certainly, we've done that. We started by uh, steroids immediately if we think we've got an RPGN. Um, I haven't always done that uh, with uh, with this, but that, that, in my personal opinion, that's not uh, that's not the, that's not a uh, uh, unreasonable thing in some patients. If you really think you've got minimal change and they're very nephrotic, get a you know a few days ahead, a few days ahead of it. I think the important thing here is really, you know, anticoagulation shouldn't be delayed. That's that's probably important. And I don't know that we have an answer to, to Dr. Glassick's question about PLA two positive. You know, I think that the data points towards that being enough. And we, we could talk about that later, whether or not, you know, there are cases of malignancy in PLA2 positive patients and whether or not that means that even if you have a PLA2 positive, you should work out for malignancy, which is, I think, Dr. Corbett's point, or might be one of his questions. And maybe we can get into that later. So, but I think for time, for the time, uh, Prevere, uh, should I spin the wheel? Yep, it is time. Give me a second, let me spotlight it. As Awesome predicted, it would it would it would go on him. Uh, he predicted this on rounds, and indeed he was right. Awesome. Yep, I'm here. Awesome. This may be Awesome's last read, but it may not be because uh, it seems to like him. But uh, maybe we can just keep him on just cause. Keep him on the wheel because he does such a great job. Yeah. All right, Awesome. Okay, I'm going to give you control in a second here. Click on the screen. All right, go ahead. That's you. Remember, there's a lag. Mm -hmm. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, sounds good. So, um, we have a low-power uh, trichromistain to look at the fibrosis. Um, I don't really see a lot of uh, bluish staining material, maybe somewhere in the middle. Um, but otherwise, the tubules look pretty back-to-back. -back. Um, so not a lot of fibrosis, maybe less than 10%, which would be probably expected with such a low creatinine and normal creatinine as well. OK, sounds good. Wait a second, awesome. Mm -hmm. yep. All right, so is that um, in HNE, &E, low power HNE? &E? Yes. Okay, yeah, so low power HNE &E stain. Um, we are looking at, there are, I see at least three gloms, one here, then there, and then this one. It's hard to comment on such a low power uh, on the morphology. At least I don't really see any obvious crescents um, here. Um, but again, the tubules themselves look pretty much healthy to me. Um, they are pretty much back to back as well. Um, I don't know if they are slight thrombi or is it just like the uh, within the uh, within the glomerular capillary cuffs? Yeah, it looks like unlysed red cells. Uh, okay. get, yeah, thrombi are usually like a pink, bright pink. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Oh. So again, it's, uh, it's pretty low power. So I don't really, I can't really comment much on the glom here as well about the patency of the glomerular capillary walls. But I do see that the Bowman's space seems pretty open to me. Um, again, even in this power, I don't really see or appreciate much of the uh, crescents. Um, again, one of the differential here is the minimal change disease, which by definition should look normal on the um, 
on the um, you know light microscopy. Perfect. Next screen. All right, so now we have a um, high power H&E stain. Um, we have GLOM sitting here right in the middle. It looks pretty beautiful. You know, the capil glometer capillary tuft seems to be open. Um, again, there are some, um, you know, unlyced red blood cells that we can see in the, the capillary lumens. Um, but other than that, I don't really appreciate any uh, thickness of the, the GBM per se. I don't really see much of mesangial expansion either. Um, here around the vascular pole, I do see there are more, more cells here, but I, I presume that's probably normal, right? Uh, we have the hilum over at three o'clock, and then you have the macula densa, those nuclei uh, line straight in the, uh, Okay. Um, and then we do have a little bit of fibrosis up around one to two o'clock in the interstitium up there. Here. All right. Around the sorrow. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Um, other than that, again, no crescents, as I said, the Bowman's space seems pretty open to me. Um, so I don't have much findings here in this particular slide, except for that looks pretty normal. The tubules themselves look um, healthy. Um, yeah, I do see that the, you know, the epithelial cells are pretty much intact. Um, and, but I can comment more on the brush water in the PS stain if you have any. Okay, good. Another high power H&E stain. Um, we have a glom in the middle. Um, again, I don't appreciate any crescents. Uh, the moment space uh, seems pretty open to me. Um, glomerular capillary, there is some area where there might be some mesangial expansion, um, but you know, I, it really doesn't glare out to me. Uh, I don't really appreciate focal areas of mesangial hypercellularity either. Um, so this looks to me like another normal glom, to be honest, except for some of the lysed RBCs that we see in the glomerular capillaries. Yeah, and then right in the middle, the mesangium's a little bit expanded right in the Around middle, and a little bit hypercellular. I see, you know, okay. four or five nuclei in that mesangial area, gotcha. but, but, uh, but otherwise normal like the other ones. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, and the, the tubules again, um, look pretty good to me. I don't know if there is some sloughing here. Is that right to say, or is it just the? I'm sorry, stuff in where? Is there any sloughing here in this tubule or on this part or? Oh, uh, it may just be a, you know, fixation artifact. We'll, we'll, need, to see, we'll need to see the PAS stain um, okay. because the epithelium looks normal thickness, doesn't really look thinned out. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, and, and as uh, Casey said, it's right on the edge, so. Okay, you know. sounds good. And then there's a the little arterial right over there at uh, three o'clock, far edge of the biopsy that looks normal, no hyalinosis. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, now we have got a PS stain. Again, there is a glom in the mid, sorry. Right, so we have a um, high power PES stain with a glom in the middle. Um, again, the Bowman's space looks pretty open, no obvious crescents here. The glomerular capillary um, lumens seem pretty open and patent to me as well. Uh, maybe around this area again, one can say there is some mesangial expansion. Um, I'm trying to see if I can find any areas of hypercellularity, maybe a focal area of hypercellularity around this part where I can see maybe four or five. Well, 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 the, so the H&E is better for the hypercellularity. Um, uh, and uh, over at three o'clock, we have you know the hilum. Uh, and this is that same glom we saw two slides ago. Uh, okay. I think the mesangium looks pretty normal here. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, that 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 H and E looked 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 pretty much normal. So 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 does this one. All uh, right. The, the glomerulus. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, 
yeah, other than that, again, as I said, this, this looks pretty normal. Um, yeah. Not much, you know, obvious. Um, yeah. Yeah, the two bills have brush borders, and then and then uh, at one or two o'clock uh, on the screen, you have a little bit of interstitial fibrosis. You can see those two atrophic tubules there, mm -hmm. uh, the thickened basement membranes. Yeah, I see. David, what's that pink blob inside of the arterial, the in the vascular pole, the afferent or the efferent? Three o'clock. This far. Yeah, I, I can't say say for sure what that is. I mean, I assume it's uh, uh, some uh, unliced red cells, I suppose. You see the same stuff in the capillary loops if you go out there at like nine o'clock. Yeah. I, is it just, are they lysed red cells or? Yeah, yeah, it must be, yeah. Next. Right, so we have um, Jones or silver stain. Um, we are primarily looking for any holes, uh, ruptures, uh, splits here. Um, I don't really see any of those features here. Um, yeah, the, the glomerular capillary wall seems pretty thin to me. They are, again, probably this area, there is some. Again, uh, well, I can't really comment on the mesangial Cellularity here, but this seems a little expanded to me, right in there in the center. Okay. Um, well, what's your What's your call right now? If you were going to make a call on this biopsy, what are you going to what, what lesion do you think it is? I would say it's minimal change. You know, everything seems to be pretty normal. Um, that would be my first differential here. Yeah, so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no spikes or holes here on the silver stain. Yeah, I don't see any spikes or holes. There's either. another silver stain coming up too. I don't. Okay. I think the next is the email for essence. Is it? Okay, yeah. so this was the silver. But you're right. They, no spikes or splits or anything was seen on the silver stain. Mm -hmm. So next. So Not so minimal. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, this is pretty strongly positive for IgG. Um, more so, I mean, it, it stains all the glomerular capillary walls, I would say. Um, I don't think there is a lot of mesangial staining. Is, it, is that right to say, or is it more so in the capillary walls, I think? Yeah, that's right to say. Okay, okay. So yeah, that, that's, um, that's pretty interesting. Do you see a, a granular pattern at all? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it should be qualified as a granular pattern. Right? Yeah, we'll see it on higher power, but that, if you look, Look, it looks quite granular. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so both kappa and lambda are staining positive, so that rules out any, um, you know, light chain restriction here. So um, I wouldn't say there is any component of paraproteinemia based on that. Yep. So. On a scale of zero to three, the glomeruli contain finely granular capillary wall staining for IgG, which is the most strongly positive at three plus. Um, IgA and IgM are focal, one plus positive. Gamma and lambda, as we said, it's strongly positive but for both of them. C1Q is also focal positive and C3 trace. Uh, PLA2R is negative and um, serum antibodies negative as well. Okay. Um, so next. All right, so we have the EM here. Um, just to orient ourselves, I would say this is all, I'm tracing all along the glomerular capillary wall. And then if you, here we have the, um, the vascular space and the outside is the, is the Bowman's space. Um, what's glaring out is basically the thickness of the GBM. I mean, it's pretty thick. Um, and I do, I should say probably these are more of, um, there are intramembranous deposits and there are some subepithelial deposits as well. Um, all yeah. along the GBM, I don't really see much of subendothelial deposits here. It's mostly intramembranous. Um, the foot processes themselves look to be 
you know, they look pretty intact to me. I don't know if there is any, there might be some focal effacement, but otherwise these foot processes seem pretty healthy to me. Yeah, um, this is diffusely effaced. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm sorry. I always struggle yeah. with the foot processes yeah. for some reason. But, um, You'll get a 95 out of 100 for your biopsy you read. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have to have them come back next week until he gets, yeah. <laughs> until he gets 100 out of 100. Yeah. <laughs> I stay on the wheel. That's fine. Yeah. That's and great. even there's some microvillous transformation there just to the left of the screen. Uh, you could yeah. Here. Yeah, yeah, I don't really see the arrow moving around, but yeah, yeah, yeah this is diffuse effacement. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the microvillus uh, for me, it's above the foot processes uh, on the, you know, from about uh, on the left side there, you can see those little villi. That's, uh, but if you look, I mean, everything on top of the, the membrane is pretty fused. Mm. You don't really see any, any uh, non effaced uh, foot processes. Okay. Yeah, so thick GBM with intramembranous and subepithelial deposits that kind of goes along with the, I would say, membranous. Are there really a lot of intramembranous deposits, so David? Right now, yeah. I mean, once you said that, I started looking. I, I, I don't really see any intramembranous deposit. I think these are all subepithelial, yeah, which, which is, explains why on the silver stain there wasn't much change. That's right. So, I mean, if you go back to that Turg classification, these are like class, you know, Turg ones. They're basically just yeah. subepithelial. You don't even see spikes hardly. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. All right, let's go to the next slide. Here, awesome. I can do it. Give me a second, okay? Here we go. This is the last EM. Just give it a second. There you go. All right. So, another EM. This would be the vascular space. Outside is the the Bowman's space. Um, again, looking at the the glomerular capillary wall, there are subepithelial deposits here along this area, which kind of goes all along the capillary wall. Um, then here is the yeah, yeah, right there is the mesangial notch. Um, so it's going over the mesangial area there. Yep. Here, right. This yeah. is the mesangial area. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then now I would say again, there is effacement of the food processes. Um, so yep. pr pretty you much the same. yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's, let, the let's move along here. Let's get to the diagnosis. What's your diagnosis? Awesome. So the diagnosis would be PLA to R negative membranous. Good. And, um, you know, I, I suppose had we waited for the PLHR, it wouldn't really have mattered here. Mm -hmm. uh, would have been biopsy either way, which is Dr. Glasser's point. Unfortunately, he had to leave early. I think we have a poll here, uh, Prevere. Yep. Before we discuss this, let's uh, let's poll everybody. Uh, this is the poll question. Um, and there, there's your poll. So please pe put your vote in. Let's see what people think. Uh, would you do, in addition to RAS blockade, the Ponticelli regimen, which is some form of cyclophosphamide, um, basically a cyclophosphamide oral-based regimen, a calcineurin inhibitor, uh, C is rituximab, or D, a cancer evaluation prior to any of the above. Come on, people, vote. We've got 34 people. I want to, I want a, a, a minimum of... 50% there. We're 50% there. Oh, I see 12 of 25. Mm -hmm. Okay. A couple more votes. Well, this is really interesting. Okay. Uh... We can lock that up. Um, so about a third said rituximab and about uh, two thirds said a cancer evaluation prior to any of the above. Um, let me, uh, Bill, are you on? Dr. Whittier? He's on, but I don't think he's, uh, he said he won't be able to talk. Okay, that's fine. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Bill. I missed that. Uh, Casey, what do you, what, what would you do here? A, B, C, or D? I would definitely do D. Um, I would not immunosuppress unless I know. I mean, rituxan is part of a lot of these chemo regimens, but if this is a solid tumor, the guy's a smoker, you know, I would definitely do a cancer screening before I I put this guy on any kind of an immunosuppression. 
And what would that and what would that cancer screening? Well, entail? since he's a smoker, I would do a CT of his chest, PSA, colonoscopy, all of that. Okay. Um, I'm a little surprised that you know I think rituximab uh, completely won out here, but of, of those who have primary treatment, I think rituximab is, seems to be winning these days, and uh, people have thrown away the Ponticelli regimen. But I think, you know, mark my word, it's going to have a, a bit of a resurgence for for various reasons. Um, uh, next, let's let's go on. So, Steve. So as a result of the CT scan with that thickening that they saw, they went ahead and pursued an EGD, which demonstrated a five by four centimeter mass in the greater curvature of the stomach. Uh, they biopsied this and it was actually found to be a schwannoma, which is in general a benign Schwann cell tumor. I think the next slide shows the tumor. I don't, David, if you want to describe the cells. Yeah, so uh, we have a, a spindle cell neoplasm. Uh, you could see, um, yeah, in the center, the nuclei are elongated and kind of cigar shaped. And there's uh, no significant cytological atypia. Uh, and uh, the nuclei are kind of arranged. Uh, it's called a palisading pattern. Uh, and uh, this is all classic for a schwannoma. Okay. Um... I think we have another poll. Is that right, uh, Previer? Okay, so poll number two, what would you do now? Would you now give the Ponticelli regimen? Would you now give calcineur inhibitors? Would you now do rituximab or would you do a partial gastrectomy? It's a pretty benign tumor for talking about uh, can cancer-related membranes, so we'll see what people say. It's quite nephrotic too. I mean, it's probably part of it. Come on, a few more people. Perfect. Great. So it's a pretty pretty close to before. You know, a little more rituximab, a little less par partial gastrectomy. We've got 53% partial gastrectomy. They want to see if the tumor is related. Third, they're sticking with the rituximab. And we've got a couple, we've got a Ponticelli and a, um, and a single Ponticelli and a single CNI. You're able um, to commend someone. Yeah. Uh, maybe I threw them off with my... Ponticelli Renaissance, no pun intended. Um, Steve, you want to uh, tell us some more? Sure, why don't we go to the next slide? So, as I think Roger already alluded to, you know, we usually think about these as being carcinoma related as opposed to benign tumors. And at least for me, one of the first big reviews that kind of shone a light on nephrotic syndrome and, and uh, glomerulopathies associated with cancers was one that Ed Lewis did along with one of the former fellows who then was, uh, who became an attending, and they published this editorial in 1977. Um, can I control this now, or Prabir, are you doing it? I can Go give ahead. you control. Give me a second. Go ahead. Click. And so, so in this, you know, in the, as you can see here, um, they looked at minimal change, memorous, MPG, and an amyloid. Next slide. And it was one of the ones that really kind of pointed out that minimal change was associated with Hodgkin's disease, at least in, in, in many cases. And next slide. And in membranous, it was associated with uh, certain carcinomas. The one thing that I didn't realize until I went back and looked at this paper uh, was that benign tumors were actually had been associated with uh, some of these lesions. And actually, two of the three that they had pathology on had membranous. Because in the past, again, I was always under the impression that these were always carcinomas. And in general, I didn't think hematologic malignancies would be associated with uh, a membranous lesion either, but uh, it can be. So benign tumors, uh, at least in their series, and I wasn't able to find any reference to what the tumors were, at least could be associated with a membranous. Next. So we, we kind of went through when this case came around just did a quick literature search to see what there was associated with schwannomas. And sure enough, uh, this is one from Boston. Helmut Rinke was the pathologist where they found a duodenal schwannoma associated with membranous. Uh, and it was a 69-year-old male who presented with nephrotic syndrome. Uh, creatinine was normal. Albumin was low, had proteinuria of three and a half grams, was PLA2R negative, like our case. Uh, the stain, as you can see in the right lower corner, was also negative on the biopsy. Uh, in addition to the antibody being negative in the serum, a secondary evaluation had been done, which was negative. And the duodenal schwannoma was resected. 
the kidney was found to be positive. Uh, I'm sorry, the kidney and the schwannoma were found to be positive for thrombospondin uh, type one uh, domain 7A. And post resection, this patient went into remission. Uh, the next slide shows the staining they did, you know, for the thrombospondin uh, 7A. And you can see the little red dots all around uh, the loops in the kidney. And if you look, uh, hopefully the resolution is good enough for you that you can see the red dots in the schwannoma as well. So where the assumption here is, is that the, the schwannoma uh, and the kidneys shared the thrombospondin DA and the antibodies to the uh, thrombospondin and cross-reacted and, and led to membranous GN. Uh, and when the, when the tumor was removed, uh, I guess the antigen source was gone, if, if you will, and, and uh, the antibody abated and, and they went into remission. We looked and found one other, next slide. There was one other case that I could find of a member associated with a spinal schwannoma. And this paper was sold, I couldn't pull it up, so I had to just use the abstract. But again, the patient presented with nephrotic syndrome, uh, they re resected the uh, schwannoma and the patient went into remission. Uh, so it's not a lot of cases, but there are a few out there. Uh, next slide. One more. So there was a, a, a really nice article that was done. It was a Belgian-based series, this handset. Uh, it was published in AJKD in 2020. And Cynthia Nass, who's a nephropathologist at Cedar sinai who's excellent, I think actually her, her editorial was better than even the article. Uh, and basically what they looked at was uh, 177 patients with membranous, of whom 66% with PLA2R positive, 3% were thrombospondin uh, 7A uh, positive, and you can read, you can see the rest. Nell was 1.2%. And what they found was that 50% of the six patients that had uh, thrombospondin 7A uh, had malignancies associated with them. Uh, in one of them, they were able to find uh, thrombospondin staining positive in the malignancy as well as in the kidney. Um, and in two of the three, when they removed the, when they treated malignancy, they actually uh, had improvement, if not remission of the proteinuria. What I found interesting was they also found 12% of the PLA2R antibody positive patients as or positive patients as having malignancy as well, whether it was just serendipitous or whether they're related. They didn't get into much more about those patients, but a percentage of them actually had uh, hematology and the supplement it told, told the various types of malignancies they had. And uh, a number of them actually had hematologic malignancies. Uh, then you can see with exostosin, uh, the, the malignancies were much less. And then as has been talked about before with NEL1, uh, anywhere from 50 to 80% in the Mayo Clinic, for some reason, in the Mayo Clinic uh, cohort, there were no malignancies associated with NEL1. Uh, and then in the patients that were PLA2 thrombospondin negative and negative for the other uh, antigens as well, there was a 22% malignancy history. So that's so incredible. That's yeah. incredible because 50% in one, granted, it's an N of two, and 80% in the other, which is N of five, the largest N of all has none of them standing for L NL1. That's, there's, that's really, I don't even know how to explain that. Yeah, especially the Mayo Clinic, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, I, um, I, I don't either. I, I don't either. But this whole idea, you know, the, and, and, you know, people have talked about that. We've talked about it at this conference before, you know. Uh, thrombospondin uh, has been found in gallbladder tumors that, uh, you know, it's thought to be the stimulus for the antibody that then leads to membranous uh, in these patients. So it's, I think it's just kind of a nice, it's kind of an interesting uh, possibility in our patient. Uh, again, we didn't, the, the tissue that we had, uh, this was an outside biopsy. There was no tissue left because we had talked to the people down at Arcana who were going to do the staining for us. Uh, but there was nothing in the block left to stain, so we weren't able to really uh, pursue that. Uh, next slide. So, interestingly enough, due to the severe nephrosis, th they were leery to do go right to doing a gastrec a partial gastrectomy on the guy because that was kind of the recommendation we made as a, as a second opinion. Uh, so they wanted to start treating empirically. And again, we don't you know there aren't that many pick, uh, cases of schwannoma, so it's hard to know whether this is. In this guy's case, it's just a serendipitous finding, or you know, if it's if it's causal or not. But they put him on prednisone and cyclophosphamide along with lisinopril. But five months later, despite immunosuppressive uh, therapy, his creatinine or his uh, proteinuria was still six, in fact, higher, 16 grams of albumin down to one one. 
The prednisone was discontinued. He remained on oral cyclophosphamide and valsartan, and then underwent a partial gast uh, gastrectomy, uh, removing the schwannoma. Steve, was that because they just thought he was a poor, poor surgical candidate? Because Yeah, that was, it was all about that. I mean, I actually called the surgeon and talked to him and, and said, look, you could actually cure this guy if this is what's going on and, and save him, you know, immunosuppressive therapy. We talked about rituxan as well, but for, I don't know if his insurance wouldn't pay for it, but it was decided to go ahead with cyclophosphamide. But yeah, it was all about, they, they felt his hypoalbuminemia would lead to poor healing and they just didn't want to take the chance. Ironically, they still ended up having to do surgery on somebody who had an albumin of 1.1. Uh, also, after five months of, uh, I know, I know, of cyclophosphamide. I mean, you know, it's retrospect, but it is retrospect, and and he had gotten a more than an adequate course, that's for sure. So the next, I, I don't know if the next is a poll. I think. Well, I think you have uh, your follow up first, right? Oh, fine. I didn't know if he'd gotten to that. So three months post partial gastrectomy, he felt. Well, I actually called him last night uh, and talked to him. Feels great. He has no edema. Uh, he's being tapered off to cyclophosphamide, which is appropriate, and, and hopefully that will occur fast. And they switched him from uh, lisinopril to valsartan, and he, he was on us torvastatin as well as uh, for his hyperlipidemia. His urine protein creatinine ratio was down to 2.5 grams from 16 grams after, again, three months post-partial uh, post gastrectomy. Albumin was, had doubled, and his creatinine still remained normal, and his cholesterol you know, possibly a combination of statin plus improvement in his al serum albumin and, and decrease in proteinuria was down to 167. And his LDA, which had been, I want to say was in a couple hundred, it was down to 88. So he, he did extremely well. So I think the next question is the kind of question of the day. Yeah, so this is, this is poll number three. What do you guys think helped this patient? Five months of cyclophosphamide. Certainly cyclophosphamide isn't, you know, Immunotherapy for membranous doesn't work right away, so maybe it finally just kind of kicked in. Or B, uh, the uh, resection of the schwannoma. <laughs> I'm laughing at the poll results. I don't yeah. know if y'all see it, but it's pretty interesting. Get a couple more. Yeah, I'll give it a little more time. Come on, a couple more votes. There we go. Perfect. Yeah, so everybody voted on, uh, they think it was the schwannoma resection, you know, and I think it gets back to the point that, you know, he had this little uh, lesion in his stomach that, you know, did, people didn't really appreciate too much when we discussed it, um, we kind of blew it off. And um, turns out that it's very likely that that could be uh, the etiology of his nephrotic syndrome, you know, a couple things, we didn't appreciate the, 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 the lesion. Um, and didn't you know the the that benign lesions don't often lead to membranous perhaps i think we learned a little bit from that um and uh you know i think steve had a, made a great point because he showed a case basically identical to this it, where who had a schwannoma was resected and frotic syndrome went away and but more importantly they they de they determined thrombus bonded both in the tumor and the uh, glomerulus so steve what do we were we able to get any secondary staining on this uh, biopsy no, I mean, unfortunately, like I said, there was nothing, there was no tissue left in the paraffin block to send. And I have to admit, we didn't, the, the indirect way of doing this would have been to, to send the pathology from the schwannoma, I guess, down to have them look at that, because that could have been stained too. And, and uh, we, did, we, we didn't do that. Yeah. We tried well, to I do mean, the kidney. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, it'd be nice if you could, if that was the case. Uh, Casey says pronase digestion, but that, that's assumption that you've still got a block. Now, I don't know if that you could do pronase on a slide that's already been processed. I don't, I don't know about that. We always hear about sending them the block and then they recut it and, and everything. Uh, Dick, do you, uh, Dr. Glassick, I see you're back. Do you know if somebody, you don't have a paraffin block, but you've got some slides that were previously stained. Can you do any special uh, uh, staining on that? Or is it, if it's already been processed, you can't really go back? Yeah, I see it there, but maybe it's not. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to. Unmute. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't know how they, you know, how they take the cover slip off and not destroy the tissue. I mean, I mean there surely must be a way to do that. Yeah. Well, it's, regardless, I mean, that would have been interesting if there's any way you could tell, because, I mean, it's a great report. Unfortunately, somebody's already trumped you on it, and they've done it in such a nice way. But, uh, you know, now it's, we've got two cases of maybe schwannoma-related. Uh, well, I say indirectly, 
one way to do it is there should there, I would su assume there was plenty of tissue from the partial gastrectomy, which could if there's still some. I'm sure they still have the block on that. We could have them. We could get that and try and send it down, because if it was in the gas in the schwannoma in this case, just like in the other case, you could kind of extrapolate that maybe that was the case. You know, that was the situation. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, David can find out that we've got uh, now we've got a, a connection with Mayo and we can we can find out if there's anything that we have that we could send there it would be kind of interesting. I don't know that changes anything. It probably uh, doesn't. I, I, I have to agree with the crowd that uh, it was a schwannoma removal, but it's very possible that, you know, we all see lag in proteinuria with with uh, with membranous, and we, when we can follow PLA2Rs, the PLA2R goes down months before the proteinuria goes down. So it's very possible that he just had a, a slow response. But I, I think it's a real, this, the way he responded to the gastrectomy, or maybe you just want to believe it, but uh, that he, um, that, that that was the treatment, that was probably the pathophysiology of it all along. I mean, five months um, is a good course of cyclophosphate. Oh, it's a good course, but yeah, you know, it could take it can take a uh, you know nine months sometimes before the proteinuria really resolves. So, but I, I still agree with you. I just got we have to be careful. Um, yeah, here's one. Maybe. Up. Yeah. <laughs> it went from nine to sixteen, but I'm not arguing with you. I'm just saying it is interesting. Yeah, and I appreciate all the comments in the chat. You know, a lot of people, especially. Uh, Dr. Reen and, and uh, Mystery Geisinger Nephrology, who's, uh, we need to put a name on that so we can call this person out and not hide under his his or her institution. <laughs> but um, we really appreciate the thoughts and uh, the, the input on this. Um, uh, let's wrap this up. I want to thank everybody. I don't know if we'll be on next week. Uh, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of COVID in Chicago these days. Um, and I, I want to make a point, you know, after every biopsy conference, I always say, you know, stay safe. It's my uh, good night, good luck equivalent. But, you know, it was getting old after a while because I, we all thought the, uh, the the pandemic was going away, but it's not going away and it's coming back with a vengeance. Um, and and so I really mean be safe. People need their doctors. So uh, be very careful and try to try to be available for them. Uh, with that, I uh, uh, keep an eye out for next week. We'll let you know and stay safe. <laughs>